Kosu. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to welcome Dr. Gregory Ijiwola online again. Over to you, sir. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Brother Tayo. I love the enthusiasm with which you celebrate people. That's a, that's a really, really uh, powerful, powerful way to live life. And, um, and you can see it that, you know, as you celebrate people, you see all kinds of collaborations just springing up all around you to make the world a better place. So you are doing an awesome job, awesome job. Uh, once again, I would like to appreciate everybody on the call. Uh, it was great to see the vice chancellor again and to hear and to hear you speak. And you know, while you were speaking, even though I had, you know, I had some uh, some things that I had, you know, prepared that I wanted to speak, but, you know, just, the name MacPherson University, just, um, you know, I spoke to MacPherson University, I think earlier this year, I spoke to the student and all, and uh, earlier this year, but it really, really did not, you know, hit me like it hit me when you were talking about what MacPherson was doing, just in various um, spheres, in preparing students, the scholarships and all that. But then I just remembered, you know, I just thought about it, Mark Frosting. Then I remember a, a, situ a, a trip that I took, I think about maybe probably about 10 or more years ago, I took a trip to Australia. And um, on my way back from Australia, I stopped at Los Angeles. So I decided when I went to Los Angeles, I, I said, okay, I got to visit some places there. Of course, when you go to Los Angeles, you want to visit Hollywood and all that. But one of the places I went was the Angelos Temple, from Angelos Temple, which is now the Dream Center. And if you all know the history of the Angelos Temple, the Angelos Temple was founded by Amy Semple McPherson, the founder of the Foursquare Mission worldwide. And well, when you were talking about what McPherson University was doing, I just, my mind just went back to that. And my mind went back to the stories that I have read, uh, bio, uh, biographies of Amy Semple McPherson. And I just wanted to start this short talk uh, with that. So McPherson University right now, making a difference many, 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 many years after Amy Semple McPherson passed away. Amy Semple McPherson was inspired by somebody when she was a, when she was a young child, her parents used to take her to Salvation Army. So she used to serve in the Salvation Army. And if you know the issue of the Salvation Army also, Salvation Army started in England. Right. So it was, it was so the vision of Salvation Army started just because an individual looked at all the things that was going on in England then, a lot of poverty, just a lot of things. And then he began to propose a solution. He actually wrote a book called In Darkest England, The Way Forward. You know, that's a book that I, I think every young person should read, In Darkest England. Uh, the Way Forward by General Booth, General William Booth, the one who founded the Salvation Army. So, so hundreds of years ago, somebody started Foundation Army, uh, sorry, Salvation Army, and then impacted Emerson from McPherson. Now Emerson from McPherson began a work, and now McPherson University is transforming the lives of people right now, of young people in Nigeria. Now, what's the common trend between those three entities that I just spoke about? It was individuals, just like any one of us. They were young, they had their weaknesses. They, I mean, they lived at a time where many of the things that we have right now that we have right now 
did not, was not present. Technology was not as developed, but it was something that was developed in their lives. And that's why they left a lasting legacy. And that thing that was developed in their lives was what we call purpose, what we call vision. Somewhere along the line in their lives, they were living ordinary lives, just like any other person. But somewhere along the line, they were illuminated. They saw something about the world that they lived in, that this world had something missing. They saw something missing in their world. And then they saw something within themselves that I could do something about it. So whenever needs meet with a cause, that's when transformation begins. Needs are opportunities. All the problems that we have in our societies right, societies right now, they are opportunities. They are opportunities for waiting for people who have causes within them to meet those needs. And in doing that, make a difference, but also leave a legacy. So I want to speak to the, you know, all the young people in this place, even to the older people. Look around you. Look around you. What are the problems that you see? Now, you are not able to solve all the problems. But as you begin to look more intently, more deliberately at the problems, and you don't join the rank of the complainers, as you begin to look at those things more intimately, more intensely, suddenly something will begin to rise up within you, and you begin to identify the ones that you have been designed to solve. That's why I love all those SDGs. Those SDGs, of course, they came together, you know, to put it together. Several nations came together to put it together. One of those things, one of the things that it does is that it allows you to focus and to see some of the, some of the needed things in this world. And as you focus on those things, you begin to discover that there's a part, there's one part of these goals that connect with you as a person. So once you get that, if you are at that point right now, you, that's the first step. That is the first step to living a purposeful life. The first step is to see what is around you, what is missing around you, what are the problems that are around you. And the second step is to see yourself in one way or the other, making a difference in those areas. So now how do you move from there? How do you move from there if you're at that point where you already see something and you are not part of the complainer? And that's why I will you know, like to encourage you. There are a few things that you can do. And Brother Tayo represents that. You see, when you have a purpose, you have a purpose that you want to get accomplished, that is burning within you. The major vehicle to the accomplishment of that purpose is relationships. Is relationships. No man can be an island unto himself. That was, you know, a poem written by John Donne many, many years ago. It was actually it was a sermon. Many people don't know that he was a pastor. You know, he, was, he actually preached that sermon when he said, when he said, no man can be an island unto himself. In other words. Another way of saying it is that there's no way that we can accomplish and achieve significance except we do it in a community of people. So that is why it is important for us to understand relationships. And based on the theme of what we're doing today, intergenerational relationships, very, very important. There's a story in the Bible, and actually two stories in the Bible. I'll tell you the first one that most people are familiar with. Um, as you all know, I'm a preacher, so I always bring the Bible in, no matter. It doesn't matter where I stand, whether I stand before business people and all that, I'll bring it in because I believe the Bible is a transformational, it's one of the most, if not the most transformational um, writ that the world has ever seen. And it has changed society. 
So two stories there. The one, the one very, very popular that everybody knows is David and Goliath. In David and Goliath is a story of how the younger generation saved the older generation. Everybody in the older generation, they were shaking at their boots. But then somebody who was a young person comes up and looks at the problem that everybody was shaking at their boots at and says, why are you all afraid? Let's get this, let's get this thing done. Let's get this guy out of the way. That's one of the ways that things get done. For the adult here, there are many things that we see, I mean, the older people that we see, and because of what we have experienced and because of where we have been and because of what has taken place and some of the failures that we have seen, we have become jaded. And then we don't see it so much more as an opportunity. We see those things as fixtures. We see them as just the status quo that will continue. But then a young person comes with fresh eyes and looks at the same thing and just sees it in a totally different way. And then they go for it. Now, what are we supposed to do as the, as the, as the older generation? We're supposed to support them. We're supposed to support them. We, we shouldn't try to give them our hammer, just like Saul tried to give David his hammer. We should allow them to use their slingshots. In other words, we should allow them to use what they have been trained to do. And if you are a younger one, yeah, they are, you know, there are things you can learn. I'm going to tell the second story, which is for the younger ones. There are things you must learn from the, from the older generation, but don't let what you see in the older generation intimidate you. Don't let whatever has been accomplished in the older generation intimidate, intimidate you. And don't let what the way it, is, it has been done in the past put you in a box because you are supposed to be expanding the box. You are supposed to be advancing you know, the, the way things get done. And so you are supposed to bring fresh innovation to bring down the Goliaths in our world right now in every sphere of influence. Now, the second story is the story of a king. So Rehoboam is the name of this, um, of this king. So he becomes a king, he was a young man. And then he goes to meet the elders and say, okay, I've become a king right now. How should I treat the people? So the elders advised him and said, oh yeah, this is what you should say to the people. They, gave, they actually gave him an instruction, they, they gave him an advice and the advice was this. He said, if, they said, if you will serve these people now, if you will serve them now, they will be your servant forever. If you will speak wisely, nicely, in a good way to them, they will be your servant forever. So he leaves the elders and then he goes on to meet his friends that they grew up together to listen to the advice. I mean, that was good to try and listen to advice. It's, it's a great thing, right? At least it's, he, he has a purpose and he's working the relationships around him. But what happened was that the friends that he grew up with gave him the wrong advice. They said, oh, don't listen to those elders. When you become, tell the people that my father did this to you, I'm even gonna to be tougher on you. In fact, this is gonna be a tough regime that you all are entering into. So instead of listening to the elders, he listened to the younger ones. And then he went and then he told the people. And immediately he spoke to the people. The people just told themselves, they said, everybody to your tent, O Israel. Everybody just go and focus on your own thing. We don't have any portion with this king. That was how he destroyed his kingdom from the very beginning. And what was the reason? Because he listened to the young one, but he didn't listen to the wisdom of the elders. Now, the moral of those two stories that I just told you from David and Goliath to uh, Rehoboam the king is this. It takes learning from both generation and taking the wisdom from each gener generation and throwing away the foolishness to succeed in your purpose, to succeed in what you have been placed there on this earth and to make a difference, which is what we all are here to do. That's the rent we pay for living on this earth. Life is not in its duration, is in the duration, but in its donation. What we do while we are here is what matters. You have to take the wisdom of both. Isaac Newton said, he said, if I have sinned, Further, it is because I stand on the shoulders of giants. 
Oh man, you don't have to start for the younger ones. You don't have to start, you know, again from the beginning. You don't have to reinvent the wheels. What you, what you need to do is that you need to spend time with the elders. You need to learn from them. You need to read their stories. You need to learn from their mistakes, from their experiences. And that takes you to the next level. And at the same time, don't lose your energy because part of what youth brings into the equation is you bring energy, you bring a fresh look, you bring innovation, and then you bring longevity. Because while the elders wrap up their game while here, that's just when you are just beginning your game. So we need both to come together. So find your vision. Then number two, find your people. If I want to summarize it, if you want to, if you want to make a difference in this world um, and in this area that we just talked about, find, first of all, your vision, your purpose. Number two, find your people. Find your people, find your tribe. You, you will go fast if you go, you may go fast, let me say, you may go fast if you go alone. But if you want to go far, you have to go with people. So find your people. I encourage everyone to build relationship. It's one of the reasons why we are born into relationships because it's essential. So you have family relationships, you have all that. So start from family, move on uh, to uh, you know, different kind of relationship that begins to come around you as you go to school. Uh, on this call right now, there are different people that are speaking in here that you feel like, wow, I need to connect with Davina. I need to connect with David. I need to, you know, I just love what they are doing. That's the way, that's the way this thing works. Build collaborative relationships. And right now, because the world is flat, right? On this call right now, we are people from India, from the United States, from Canada. The reason is because the world is flat now. You understand? In, before, this was difficult. But through technology, the world has become flatter. Build intercontinental relationships. Build intercontinental relationships. Build intersectoral relationships. What I mean by intersectoral relationship? Intersectoral relationships are relationships that, that if you are, some people are in the, in the private sector, that's business. Some people are in the public sector, that's government. Some, some people are in the nonprofit sector, right? Or what, what you would call an NGO sector. Right, build intersectoral relationships, intersectoral relationships, because right now everything intersects now. And whatever you want to do, anything that you want to do, you are going to need to operate across sectors. Build intergenerational relationships also. So I said intercontinental relationships, intersectoral relationships, intergenerational relationships, and then also build interclass relationships. What do I mean by interclass relationships? I'm talking about, you know, sometimes one of the things that have limited us is because we, cl we classify people and these are the only kind of people that I work with. But it's wisdom in all the various categories and demographics of people that exist. So build those kinds of relationships and you are on your way to the fulfillment of your, to the fulfillment of your purpose. So, Final word that I would like to say um, as, as, I wrap, as I wrap up, the, you know, the, the importance of constantly developing yourself, the importance of constantly developing yourself. When you stop growing, you start dying. When you stop improving, you start to decay. You see, there are many factors in this world that you do not have control over. There are many things. Sometimes you don't have control over the politics of this world that you're going to meet. You don't have control over the economic hebs and lows of this world. But there's one thing that you have absolute and total control of. It's your self-development. It's how you develop yourself in every segment of your life. This is the commitment of change makers. This is the commitment of world changers. Every world changer and every change maker developed 
they, they make a commitment to become lifelong learners. Lifelong learners. You do that, you keep learning. I'll give an example, I have a PhD. Uh, a PhD is a terminal degree, right? That's what they call it, but you know. But the fact that you have that doesn't mean you're learning. I mean, you, you don't continue learning. I mean, I, I, I just, yesterday I was at a, I am at, I'm doing a fellowship at the University of Chicago and I was sitting down there yesterday you know, there was a deputy mayor of the city of Chicago. There were people, just a, a couple of us on the table, you know, and I was just listening. And I, I brought I brought five problems to the place that I needed a brain trust to help me solve it, right? Some things that, you know, I'd wanted to do. Um, I had a, land pro a landed property that had been landed there for the ministry that we have not done anything about. We're thinking of building some stuff on it. You know, I had you know, I, I wanted to break into the traditional publishing world in the United States. I, so a, a bunch of problems like that. And I sat down there and the, the, I think about seven of us on the table and all that. And everybody just started talking. And I left the place with the answers and with what's next to do. So I want to encourage you all. I want to encourage you all to, to make sure that you keep on improving yourself and improving yourself, one. Become an hardened reader. Become a reader. I know it's cliche. Readers are leaders and leaders are readers. You know, that's what you know, people say. Become an hardened reader. Read beyond what you are required to read. You know, read wide. Read in various sectors. Okay. So read in various sectors. Also, Get around people, mentors. Surround yourself with people who are better than you, who know more than you in various areas. Ask very, very clear, definite questions. When you have definite questions, the answers will come. Just like it is said, when the student is ready, the teacher will, the teacher will show up. So ask clear questions. If they say, don't hide, if you can't do something, or you don't know how to do it, or you are stuck, bring it out very clearly. How do I get this done? Because there are people who are getting this done. And then you are going to receive great answers. So as you commit yourself to these three things that I've shared with you, finding your purpose, finding your people, and focusing on your personal development, I believe that we'll be able to meet these goals. We'll make a difference in the world. We'll have a better world for now and for the next generation. Thank you. Thank you. I told you. I told you. I told all of you. I told you. I told you. I prepared you. I warned you ahead that if you are going to listen to Dr. Land, you must be ready. You see, lifelong learning. Imagine Dr. Land telling me that I still have to go and learn somewhere else. Oh, can you see that? Can, can you see what we're talking about? The dynamism of humanity, of people ready to build, to change a world. Oh, thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Lan said we should learn, we should connect diversely, we should connect, uh, we should connect, meet with people all over. Thank you so much. I would like to take two questions and I'm going to take one from, um, Bowen University, then Ore Oluwa Fapa Miche, are you on this call? I need to take your question because I understand you have a question for us. I need to take your question. I need to, uh, I'm going to take one from Davina, one from um, Bowen, and um, uh, I'm going to take one from um, Ore Oluwa. Who is going to go, who's going first? Um, um, the President Barnabas, over to you. Um, all right. So, okay, sir. Um, we have a custom in Boy University. Um, we say ladies should come first, right? So I want her to come before me. Thank you, sir. She's a boy next to so, so. Oh, yes, apo apologies for that. Apologies for that. Apologies for that. I uh, is Aurelu on this call. Now, why we are waiting for her? Um, Barnabas, go. Ahead, please. We need All to right, uh, time. Thank you. 
All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I must say thank you very much, Pastor Lan, for um, the insightful and wonderful presentation. I must say I have my um, notepad full. Thank you also uh, for uh, sir, moderator for the um, prompt before the presentation. So, sir, um, my question is um, with regard to, um, um, okay, for instance, individuals, I've seen individuals who have um, who have uh, ideas around different sectors, for example, individuals working on themes from um, different sectors, and they have trouble with how everything will come together, right? They have the, that issue of how everything, for example, working on an issue, for example, working on, a, we are working on a project currently on education technology, also we're working on another project on um, on taxation in Nigeria, how to make taxation better in Nigeria. So the fear has been, okay, how will everything at the end join together? So, so what's your advice to a team of individuals in that regard um, to see that everything join together and everything come together as a conclusive whole? Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Barnabas, for the question. Um, I just want to make sure I get your question very clear. The basic question you're asking is how do you, like you have a project, a team working on a project, but it, it cuts across, across sectors, right? Yeah. So how do, how do you navigate working across all those sectors? Yes, uh, to see that you come together, yes. Okay. Now, if I may ask you, which sectors are you, uh, are you working, are you trying to navigate now? Which sectors of society are you trying to? Okay, so one is um, solely on um, finance and law, that's taxation, okay. and why the other is basically on um, is on education, the educational sector, okay. and um, basically social development. Okay, very good. Well, if you are going to do uh, intersectoral intersectoral stuff, one of the one of the first thing you need to do is you need people on your team. I don't know the makeup of the team for the project. You need people on the team that are versed, right, or competent in one or, you know, one of the one of each of those sectors. So you talked about education, you talked about finance, right? And of course I'm sure what you are doing is also going to involve maybe technology, right? Maybe so what you need to do is that you find people on your team who are competent in each of those sectors. Now, they don't have to be, there are two types, you know, there is, there is your central team and there are peripheral teams. So whenever you are trying to do something, there is the executive team, that's the, your central thing, the people that are actually executing it. But you also have peripheral teams. Peripheral teams are like teams that, you know, somebody that is a resource person that can come in to give advice. They are not necessarily part of the executing team, right? But they come in, they give you the mentor, they give advice, and they also link you up, you understand, with their own network. So if on your team you don't have people that are competent in all those areas, all you just need to do is like to just find some individuals. Do you get what I'm saying? That are in those areas and just ask them to become advisors, you understand, advisors to the project that you're trying to do, and that you will like you would like to tap into their knowledge and also you know tap into their network. So that's one of the, the first, for, first way. The most important resource for any project are the people doing it. That's the greatest asset of any organization or any, pro, of, or any project. It's not money, it's the people. So try and build up, you understand, the people. Secondly, educate yourself. So I'll give you an example. I, there's a project I'm doing right now uh, in the uh, United States called Purpose in the Workplace purpose in the workplace. So, you know, we're trying to take the training that we do for people and all that. We're trying to take it into the secular workplaces, right? So what did I do? What I did was that, because I don't work, I don't work quote and unquote secularly. Like I come in into those places to speak and do whatever, but I'm mainly in the church sphere. So what I did was that I assembled a team of people who have worked in corporate America, for decades, 
you understand? Like a diverse team, also from different races and culture. And then also they had worked in corporate America and they started, we started working on the project. Now we got into a point where we we're about to launch the project. We did the curriculum and we we're about to launch it. In fact, we're having a, a seven hour meeting today, you know, you know that, that is gonna be happening later today, the team. What we did is that we also started calling, like reaching out to people, lawyers and CPAs, that certified public accountant, all those kind of people that are outside and they come to speak to us. Do you get what I'm saying? And so we're, we're tapping into the knowledge. So that's why I said the second thing is make sure that those people on your team, on your central team, learn as much as they can about, about those sectors. So bring peripheral teams, let them learn as much as they can about those sectors. Let them have great questions that they will ask people, bring people in to help you. And then of course, start moving on, you understand? Start moving on with your project, apply you know, project uh, planning tools, project management tools, you know, business planning tools, you know, fo focus on those things and keep moving on. And when you reach a point where you need, you know, you need to, uh, you need some more information, reach out again, just keep practicing that you get to the end of your project. So that's, <clears throat> that's as much as I can say without knowing the full details. Yeah. Thank you so much. Davina, over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. I love asking questions. I think Pastor Larry knows this already. I, I, I know that. I can, I can testify to that. Davina sends me one question per day. That, oh that, <laughs> okay. Which is a great thing, like I told you. So it's a great thing. Thank you, sir. I'm going to be fast. Uh, you mentioned that we should take the wisdom of both generations and throw out the foolishness to achieve purpose. So how are we supposed to know how to filter information? How do we know how to filter information? That's, I think, my main question. Very, very great question. So it's not every advice that you receive that you are supposed to follow. Okay. So that is, that. so just understand, understand that. It's not every advice that you receive that you're supposed to follow. Secondly, some good advice, they are not for now, they are for later, okay? So, so basically it's not every advice you receive that you're supposed to follow. It's not every advice that you receive that you're supposed to follow now. So you need a way to be able to filter, like you, you know, using your word, like what you receive, the input that you receive to filter it and say, this is what I want to do, okay? So there's something in you that has been put in there. Like you have this, we have this cognitive, ability right to just know that wow this is awesome so you start with that whenever you receive ideas inputs and advice start with wow this resonates with you i'm sure you all know the subject of you know the concept of resonance right mm -hmm. you know in science resonance is when something is operating at a particular frequency right and then the other one started start to resonate at that same frequency and then a major force comes from that. So when, when you get ideas or when you meet people, do you get what I'm saying? Yes. Ideas are operating at a particular frequency. So when you hear something and it's like, wow, that, that is the answer to the question that, I, that I've been asking. Mm -hmm. That is what something that you got to, that's something actionable. But if you hear something and there's still some doubt, there's still, you know, you're still not clear about it. So it might mean that that's not what you're supposed to do or that's not what you're supposed to do now. So you table that, right? Be open to all advice. Do you get what I'm saying? So I love mm -hmm. saying, saying this statement to people. I say, I received that under advisement. I don't even know whether I received that under advisement, meaning that I receive what you are saying, right? I'll go and think about it and then I will know what to implement and when to implement it. So use that cognitive ability to, to, sort, to sort things out, right? Do you get what I'm saying? Also use your uh, mastermind, you know, have whatever you are doing, have people around you also that you, that you can all talk about advice that you have received. Do you get what I'm saying? Because why you don't resonate with one, somebody among you might resonate with one, I'll be able to be the one that will actualize that. So I always advise people to do things in teams. 
and not do things alone. So you bring it in there and you all discuss around it and discuss around it. I say, you know what? I think we're going to pick point one, point two, point three. Just like how even these SDGs, these 17 SDGs came about, right? It was from a from a collaborative environment that they came up to that. I'm sure there's an argument that, you know, that ensued that we don't know that led to it. Do you mm -hmm. get what I'm saying? So, so I advise people to, to do their projects that same way too. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of um, this wonderful session with Dr. Lan. And Dr. Lan, your final session, your final word for today, sir. Well, I mean, I would just love to say that I am really, really excited to see um, what is going on. I'm so excited. I, I feel a sense of hope for Nigeria, a sense of hope for the world. I am excited to see all the young people and to, to just, you know, read and, you know, hear what they are doing. So, and want you to know that we are here for you as a resource. You know, so, you know, make sure that you take advantage of that, reach out um, to those resources and also let you know that we are also learning from you too. So we're learning from you, uh, from all the things that you are doing. So I look forward to just uh, more interaction uh, with you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lan. Thank